thought it might be helpful to start with some provocations. <laughs> so just to get us in the mood, we've all had lunch and we might <laughs> be uh, digesting and we're probably also digesting from this incredibly rich morning. Um, the wonderful uh, plenary address keynote by Susan Bassanet. Thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, also the interesting issues raised in the first panel. So this is our chance to think about what we do as translators, or if you're not a translator, to sort of think about the translation process from whatever vantage point you're, you're in, maybe as a reader, maybe as an editor. And um, I think so often we just translate. We just have a text and we panic a little bit and we read a little bit and we seek help in various ways and then we roll up our sleeves and get to work and we may not reflect on our approach. We may not reflect on why we're approaching the text the way we are. And I think um, especially in this field where we're just beginning to think about translation theory, we may ha have operative principles but we haven't really reflected on them, or we may not have thought of why we're making the choices we're making. So I think this is what we're inviting everybody into conversation about, to reflect on that process. And um, really, theories are just, I mean, in our usage, I think, will be primarily the principles, the way we prioritize um, the choices we make. Yeah. So I just say, please. when uh, Holly and I sort of saw our assigned topic and we're mulling it over on a long distance phone call, we, we both more or less agreed that we, we didn't have any theory by which we operated. <laughs> um, and, and that was the instinctive reaction, but as we began to think and read a little more, uh, we're not so sure now. And, uh, I think the first uh, slide we have here will make that point evident. No? Okay, so our translation theory is practical. So the premise is making them practical, but um, there's a wonderful quote Roger pulled out. Had translation depended for its survival on theory, it would have died out long before Cicero. <laughs> Yet its practice has always assumed principle, the professional conscience of 2,000 years being summed up in Roman Jacobson's translation, translator of what messages, messages betrayer of what values. So um, I was really, uh, you know, touched in thinking about the hierarchy of correspondences. And we might also think about this as different kinds of fidelities we have in translation. So we wanted to ask all of you to just as an opening bid, a starter of our conversation together, what makes for a good translation? And I want you to first talk amongst yourselves in groups of two, three, four, whoever's nearby you, and really think about what are the translations you like to read and why do you like to read them? Or what are the kinds of translations you like to produce? And what is it about, what are you striving for in your own translation work? So we'll come up with a series of adjectives after you discuss that with your neighbors and sort of start to surface some issues that will um, use moving forward. So take a few minutes, talk to your neighbors, get a chance to get to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this is obviously a very lively topic and one in which everyone feels like there's lots to say, so we'd like to hear from you. And it could be a single word that you shout out or a phrase, in which case we could repeat it. If you'd like to say more, we're going to need somebody who's willing to walk around with a microphone. Okay, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. Uh, or you want to start by saying something? Oh, no, I thought we were throwing a word. Yeah, throw out your words, yep. So, a word with a slight explanation. I just sort of, I didn't know this before we talked about it, but what I personally, as a reader, find very important in a translation, that's what I call a good translation. Can people hear, or do we no. need the microphone? Oh, okay, let's... Okay, thank you, Tenzin. Shut up, can I ask you to be our microphone person for this session? Thank you so much. Hello? Okay. 
just, you know, uh, as a reader, of course, as a translator, I try to do this also, but as a reader trying to enjoy other people's translations, I find transparency a really important part of a good translation. And that transparency can be achieved in a number of ways. For the easiest way is putting parentheses or something, and this is the term that I'm translating, or footnotes or something like this. But that's what I mean by transparency, something that lets you know what choices are being made where and when and brings you along with it. OK. And that sounds like transparency to other people who are readers of Tibetan. So that's different than how the term is sometimes used. And OK, great. What else? Other terms, with or without explanation? Yeah. Uh, a couple. Uh, one is it has to sound right when it's read out loud. Mm. <laughs> uh, and uh, that it conveys meaning over being literal. Okay. And uh, n another one is that it be accessible, so that you don't have to have special, necessarily special training to understand it. OK. Thank you. Over here, I'd wait for the microphone. Just so. One that doesn't sound like a translation. Wait. Oh, sorry. Oh. I thought you were pointing. I was pointing at you, but the microphone went somewhere else. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll be um, uh, provocative and say uh, the exact opposite of what he just said. I think that, but, but I, the question being a good translation to whom, yeah. right? I mean, and so for me, when I look at a translation, I want to be able to see the original in it. Mm -hmm. And the example that I was just giving my friend here is I said, so for example, uh, you know, the mind you know, is to be apprehended as like the sky. Great. You could also translate that as uh, uh, because the wind is high, it blows my mind. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Beautiful, but I don't see the original in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 <laughs> Michelle? My e not on. I can repeat if necessary that, um, so Michelle said she would like to read a text that sounds like it was composed in English so that one doesn't necessarily feel that it's a translation. Okay. Uh, Rinpoche, in the back, shut up in the back. I think it should be inspiring. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, inspiring. And what makes a translation inspiring, Rinpoche? It... <laughs> I, have, I have seen lots of translations that uh, when you read it, uh, although I'm not a Okay, so um, technical people, we need help with the microphones if you're available. Um, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. Um, this is a translation as well. <laughs> um, so uh, having a heart quality that the text actually moves one, that, there, that that's what inspiration means. And this is particularly important for liturgical materials, for prayers, but also poetry and um, some advice texts. Okay, wonderful. What else? Yeah.
So we were discussing this and um, um, uh, one person mentioned that it should be poetic if it's poetry. Mm -hmm. In other words, you wouldn't want to translate poetry into something that didn't sound like poetry, that didn't, didn't come across as poetry. And then we also talked about the translation should be readable. It should be good English. Somebody should be able to read it. Um, and in addition, it should convey the meaning of the original. Okay, wonderful, in the back. I was just uh, repeating to Anne her, her, her phrase, functional symmetry. Say it again? Func uh, Anne's uh, term, functional symmetry. Or I might even, uh, I might elaborate that as structural symmetry mm -hmm. between the Tibetan and English. And I think we were also talking about uh, the tr that the translation reads with confidence. And I, I forget the term that Susan used, but, but I stored it in my nerd, you know, electrical engineering nerd mind as jitter. You know, it doesn't, the translation doesn't jitter. It's like a wobble. Yeah, it's like a, term, it's yeah. a steady, steady <laughs> signal. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, over here. Accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Anything we're... else to add, or that speaks for itself? Well, <laughs> so in all the conversations we've had uh, today, the fact that there are mistakes in translations has not been mentioned, and how hard it is to produce a translation without error. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the most important concern of all. All this other stuff is secondary. Now, what accuracy means, of course, we can talk about that forever, but there are mistakes, as we all know. Mistakes at the word of, at the level of word and at the level of meaning. Is grammar, everything, yeah. Grammar, grammar okay, yeah. <laughs> everything, okay. <laughs> Great. So the, the first two here we talked about, and then the last one I added based on what I've heard here, but um, readability with the meaning intact, as, as you just said, and then also uh, capturing the author's voice, mm, if, that's, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the one I just added myself, so don't hold my group responsible for this, is that I think it should be completely understand, uh, understandable to someone who does not speak the source language. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we talk about leaving, you know, parentheses, put the Tibetan word in, put the Sanskrit word in, that's fine, but for people who don't speak those languages at all, it's not really helpful, and, and you shouldn't need that in order to read it, even though it helps everybody else in the, this room. It, I, I think we need to be thinking about the readers who don't actually speak Tibetan or Sanskrit instead of the community of people who does. So. Okay, this personal. is good. We're already seeing some fissures here, so this is wonderful. We have a hand up over here, a couple of hands up over here. Thank you, Shadow. I would say something that kind of embodies a felt sense of the original meaning, and I would think that would require a pretty excellent grasp of both languages, because there's a lot of underlying meaning, especially with poetry. So, yeah. So felt sense, do you just want to define that? Um, well, I think particularly in poetry, okay. um, there's a lot of deeper meaning that isn't really just like there. Mm -hmm. And I think that could probably really be really difficult for a translator, without, especially without having the person there in front of them to actually speak to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very much a beginner translator, so I don't know the depths of this yet, but I can just imagine. And I know as a reader, I really like that um, felt sec sense experience that uh, you can really read deeper into the layers of the words. Okay, so I'm hearing aesthetics, but also sort of nuance, innuendo, those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. And then behind you. Um, for me, it really depends on, on obviously audience, but also what type of text. So people have been mentioning poetry, but it, say it's an instruction text, then I, I would like it to be, even though I don't actually believe in anything that's literal, um, I'd like it to be as close to that as possible. Um, but something that when we were talking that I thought of 
and it kind of plays on transparency and it kind of plays on accuracy. Um, I thought of completeness. I know that when I've looked at English translations of Tibetan texts and sometimes they're missing huge chunks and that hasn't been acknowledged by the translator, um, whether that's an issue of accuracy or transparency or <laughs> both or <coughs> completeness. And then the other thing that I've noticed is um, when you get a sense um, and maybe this speaks to not really hearing the author's voice, the original author's voice, but when you get a sense that the, the translator maybe has received an oral teaching and that's standing in for their translation of the text. So it's, it's something that looks like all of a sudden the voice changes and there's like a paraphrasing that looks a lot like what a contemporary Lama might have said in explaining that text and, uh, and doesn't really look like the, trend, like the, the original text. So, so that kind of, I guess, is still accuracy. I, we were talking about completeness. Great. Yeah, Cassie. Um, particularly in philosophical texts, I really like to see uh, terminological equivalence as much as possible. So if a word that's a technical term is translated at one point in a certain way, at least within that same text, I'd like to see it consistently translated throughout. So at least we can navigate the text a bit better and the philosophy. Great, okay, so consistency, yeah. And that's a, a broader issue for people who don't know the original languages, the variety of translations for some of the basic kinds of um, technical terms can be confusing for people. Um, I like inconsistency. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, good. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I like diversity of translations. Before I started studying Tibetan, when I first started studying Buddhism, it was so helpful to have different translations from you know some of the people in this room, but and also from Jeffrey Hopkins using some strange words and all that, so that so that I was able to kind of triangulate um, on the meaning instead of just relying on one person. Okay, thank you. One, maybe one last one. What's oh. response to that? <laughs> I think inconsistency is very helpful for somebody who is uh, studying Tibetan, but somebody who wants to read texts without knowing any Tibetan, inconsistency is deadly. <laughs> so it would be highly, highly, uh, it would be extremely helpful to have a standardized vocabulary. Okay, this is the bane of translators, but translators, open your ears and hear this request from your readership. <laughs> okay, was there one other, or are we, did we cover it? Oh yeah, please, Tenzin. Yeah. Actually, um, I uh, found um, the amazing, the gift of the translator, is when the translator have a really in-depth understanding about the subject and the author. Mm -hmm. If you read the uh, Chonantaranath's work, and he really knows about the author's thinking evolution mm -hmm. as well as the subject. And so you only know to get the translation, but on the footnote, you really get this like the contextual background to it. So this also, I think, happens with the Tubden Jimba when he, the Book of Katam, he knows the background a lot. And so that makes it uh, added value to the translation work. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so thinking about supplementary material, but also the trustworthiness of the translator because you, you have this sense that they have this wide context. All right, well, thank you for those. And now I just want to give them a typology. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. So um, I'm going to just go through these three and then list some of the adjectives that you came up with in the appropriate category so we can start to develop a language to talk about this together. So fidelity to the reading, to the reader, is actually, some will critique that as a domesticating uh, translation, but it's all the things that people talked about like transparency, it sounds right. It's accessible to the non-specialist. It sounds like it's written in English. Uh, it's readable. It actually is good English with the meaning intact. So the critique of that, I mean, the, 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 the great value of that is that, you know, it makes these texts accessible. And that's so important. That's sort of what we heard in the, from the 
panel on the translator's intent. That's one of the main intents of a translator, is to make this material accessible. The critique of it is, is Lawrence Venuti's invisibility of the translator. So you, the translator and the whole elaborate process of translation is rendered invisible so that the text will appear as an English language source text. So the question is always what gets lost in that accessibility. It may be accuracy. It may be uh, literary style, some of the other things that people prioritize. So it's just to say these things may be, um, they may be at odds, and they may be, we're probably all balancing pieces of each of them. So under fidelity to the original, which Venuti calls foreignizing, meaning that it's recognizable that this is a foreign text, and, um, and the fidelity is to representing the source text as accurately as possible. So we want to see the original in it. Um, we want it to have no errors, or as few errors as possible, um, close to literal, um, and terminological consistency. So there's certain demands of um, fidelity to the original source text. I think every translator, of course, has to have fidelity to the source text and to the reader. And the question is, how do we balance those when there are challenging situations of a highly technical text? Is that going to be accessible to everyone? Is it meant to be accessible to everyone? We heard those questions um, raised. Um, but you could say that the editor often holds the fidelity of the reader on our behalf, and that the translator often is the one that's holding fidelity to the original. And then we have fidelity to literary style to make it beautiful, to have it move and inspire us, to have the author's voice come through. Um, if it's poetry, it should be poetic. Um, maybe not if it's philosophy. Um, it should have some kind of structural symmetry, functional equivalence. So I think it's helpful to think about these as different types of fidelity. And um, we could add others to the list. I think Tenzin's comment about um, translations being really highly contextualized, you know, thoroughly researched. The translator is somebody who's very steeped in the author's works and in the subject matter are important in this case. So that might be fidelity to context. Um, but I think that's the question we want to raise. And um, the, the term that um, Susan Bassanet gave us is a kind of hierarchy of correspondence. How do we prioritize, even in a given line or a given verse or a given passage, which one of these, you know, how we're going to balance it? Which one are we going to give priority to? And we probably all have an instinct for that, but we may not go through a deliberate process of thinking through what is needed for this passage or this genre. No, okay. All right, any comments? We wanted to look, take you through a few examples, and then we're just going to open it wide open at a certain point. Um, OK, I cannot get the okay, ordering here. So um, uh, Octavio Paz was already mentioned earlier today, and this is my favorite quote. Um, it's really, uh, I have to say, in the genres that I work in, I, I lean towards literary. And I think there's also, somebody mentioned already in just the debrief that we had, that literal is an elusive. It's very elusive and may not even be possible. So Paz says, I do not mean to imply that literal translation is impossible. What I am saying is that it is not translation. <laughs> It is a mechanism, a string of words that helps us read the text in its original language. It's very pedagogical, actually. It's very helpful in that sense. It's a glossary rather than a translation, which is always a literary activity. Without exception, even when the translator's sole intention is to convey meaning, as in the case of scientific texts, translation implies a transformation of the original. That transformation is not, nor can it be, anything but literary. So I think that's something to give us pause. Because if it really, if we are transforming texts in the process of translating them, which I think we all know we're doing, but we like to think we're not doing, 
You know, we want to, in search for accuracy, mask our hand, our intervention in the text and in the transmission process. But if we kind of cop to it, then we really want to think through, for ethical reasons, but also aesthetic reasons, why we make the choices we make. So let's go through some examples. And then, oh, I was going the wrong way. And I want to invite, again, some discussion amongst yourselves, looking at several translations of one song by the Sixth Dalai Lama. And we have three translations here, Michael Aras, Paul Williams, and uh, Jeffrey Waters. And you can see their mutual influence, at least across time. And just to think about looking at the Tibetan, for those of you who can, and looking at the translations, what choices did each translator make? And what is captured and what is lost in each translation? So can we identify what priorities each translator had, what their fidelity was? So it takes a moment to read it and then talk with your group again for a few minutes. It's not big enough. Oh, ho, ho. OK, I'll try. So what I'll do is I'll try to, well, let's see. OK, okay it doesn't work that way. Technical help if you're still in the magic back room. Uh, you just move closer. <laughs> that didn't work. Whoops. Well, that's a different. That's later. A different but this is now things are going awry. Ah, that's the next one. Ah, going to help. Oh, great! Please. So we just want to make the. Um, the Tibetan larger. So is there a way to... Um... Yeah, I'm not sure, because this is on Fortnite. Yeah. I'm not sure if we can just zoom in towards... Why don't we try? Okay. So it's usually one of these buttons with one of these buttons. I think it's... No. So you don't... Anybody with technical... Paul? You can't do it with PowerPoint? It's a PDF. Besides, if you enlarge the Tibetan, you won't see the English. Does it PowerPoint? It's in PowerPoint. This is on a PC. I do have a, a PDF version, but it would take a while to shift into that. All right, help from the crowd. Thank you. That's OK. It's usually just like a control something. Where is your uh, mouse? <laughs> oh, you're just going to, ah. Uh... It's OK. <laughs> it's not going to go well. Um, I can make the font for the Tibetan bigger. That's what I'll do. OK. okay. Let's go back. Well, we're back. Yeah. I got it. You're good? I think so. And then can you put it back in the presentation and we'll just turn That's a good solution. Got it. Is that better? Yeah? I can read the English out if that's helpful. I'll go back to full screen now, slideshow. Um, from current slide. Is the Tibetan good? Yeah. All right. Do you want the English read or are you good with the English? If I acquiesce to the wishes of the fine lady, this life share of religion will be wasted. But if I wander off to lonely mountain retreats, it will break the girl's heart. That's Michael Aras. Suiting my bright one's heart, I lose life's religion. Heading forth a hermit, I belie my girl's heart. Paul Williams. If I do as my lover wishes, my religious destiny will be lost. But if I go meditate on some far mountain, her heart will break. Jeffrey Waters. So looking at the Tibetan, and if you can see the English, just think about um, Fidelity or priorities, what's missing? What's captured, what's lost? What choices did the translators make? 
Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to? Why don't we just do it with microphones? Since, yeah. So go ahead, Brandon. And, just following on from the discussion this morning and Carl uh, Bunholtz's comments, you can see that everyone has chosen to put in pronouns here. Yeah. <laughs> That's fairly fundamental. Yeah. Right. Good. Okay. So there's I everywhere. What else do you notice? Yes, Rinpoche. Here comes the microphone. Chu, um, for Tibetans, doesn't mean religion. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that all yeah. three translators used religion, a modern neologism would be Chiluk, but to have that stand for Chu is... So what would you suggest, yeah, Rinpoche? The... Dharma? Dharma is a Sanskrit word, yes. Uh, I don't know if there is any other English word directly depicting Chu. If Dharma has become English word, then I will use that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Good, what else do you notice? Things that are missing, things that are captured, things that are lost, yeah? Thank you. Um, I, I remarked that Tibetan is perfectly symmetric. Oh, sorry for my, I'm French, yeah? You're, you're great, <laughs> fine. <laughs> And uh, the translations are not. Mm -hmm. And there is a very simple kind of a simplicity in the Tibetan vocabulary, which doesn't appear in, in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as Trugo uh, Rinpoche said, the religion has no place here. And uh, what then? Good. I mean, and I think mm -hmm. the, the writer must have been very much in love, <laughs> <laughs> because torn. he's got much respect for, for the, for the Dhamma and, <laughs> yes. and the Pumo. So Paul Williams is trying to match the, the meter, so he's the only one, and it's six syllables. But things do get lost there, so that's, that's the really big challenge of making these choices is if you honor one thing, you lose another. For example, hermit rather than, you know, um, mountain solitudes or retreat, right? So he's actually turned the, the, the beautiful mountain setting and the lonely mountains, mm -hmm. uh, the Wempe Richa into, a, he's personified it, right? So there's all these choices that get made. What else, Michelle? Um, speaking to context, uh, I like Michael Ayers' translation because it has a kind of chivalric <laughs> feeling to it, and the elegance of that I think uh, fits the the context of the of the verse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other ones feel too clipped and short to me. It's too, it's almost like street English, you know, and it's a different. It doesn't evoke that world for me. Okay, so w evoking the world of Lhasa and the perhaps the sort, of, um, chival the sort of chivalry of we don't know exactly, you know, the milieu, whether these were um, lovely courtships that the six Dalai Lama, as he was meandering the streets of Lhasa, were having, but that it gives it a certain flavor, a high literary flavor. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with, with this uh, work, so I'm just uh, reacting sort of spontaneously. Yeah. And, you know... Uh, if you examine it, um, the first and the third, they both use for the last line, explaining tukdang ge dro, and they say break the girl's heart. Yeah. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. Tukdang ge doesn't mean break heart. Yeah. It means go, go against, against the her. wishes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one thing that I. Um, and they all make this choice. So that's interesting. That's where I think Aris. My girl's heart. That's kind of. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know closer. what that means, but... Yeah, uh, it is closer. Yeah. Be lie? Yeah. Okay. But they all choose heart, which and is interesting. Again, you know, it kind of, mm -hmm. The idea to go against is really... Mm -hmm. Be lie, does that mean that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was, I just... I know no, that's that. wonderful. So, um, down here for Susan Fastnet. Thank you. 
Well, as, as someone who has no idea whatsoever what the source text says, I don't like any of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, 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 the first one falls into that awful pattern of what I call the fake archaizing. If I acquiesce to the wishes of the fine lady, I think, oh my goodness. <laughs> Life's share of religion will be wasted. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I lose life's religion means. Mm -hmm. Belie is another false arc. And so I thought, when I first read them, I thought, well, I prefer the third one. Mm -hmm. But then I think, what on earth does my religious destiny mean? Mm -hmm. So they all, for me, wobble. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't have a sense of what's going on in the original. So this is why we need to talk to our readers. <laughs> because we all have some funny sense of, you know, of religious destiny or life's religion because we're reading Chukal and we, we like have a sense for what that means. But who would like to offer a translation of that in English that's different? Oh, please. Um, I think it's like a simplifying will help. Uh, I wouldn't read like that. If I follow the wishes of my lady, um, I'll lose my opportunity for practice. Or yeah. Basically, here, Shirken is an opportunity for your practice. Okay. In this life. If you in follow, yes, in this life, yes. In this life. Mm -hmm. Then, if you go to the tree, and then go to against the wishes of my lady. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear that? No. All right, let's, let's have a microphone, and, and you go ahead again. Is that my or does that one work? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm just trying to simplify. Um, if I follow the wishes of my lady, I will lose my opportunity to practice Dharma for this life. If I go to a retreat or in a solitary retreat, it will be against the wishes of my lady. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Susan, how, is that help? That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we've got the meaning, and then the question is, how do we capture the literary style? But that's the simplicity of that is wonderful. Yeah, well, I was noting that the uh, the phrase uh, "tuk" uh, you have in the first line, you have uh, "zongmi tuk," and the last line, you have "bumo tuk." There's a kind of play on "zongmo" versus "bumo," but in translating it, and this follows very closely to what was just offered. If I do as my love wishes, I lose this chance for practice. If I hold to the solitude of retreat, I violate my love's wishes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting, now we're getting to, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Anybody else like to offer a spontaneous translation? What did you use for Richa? That was lovely. What did you use for Richa? It was lovely. Solitude of retreat. Yeah, solitude of retreat, <laughs> yeah, with the Wempa. Okay, great. I'm not happy with Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a little strong. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other um, comments here? Um, I mean, I like, I like Wander. That's really nice to capture, you know, Jim. And uh, um, so there's, there's ways that we can also, you know, enrich by trying to capture some of the specificity or some of the maybe um, like the actual movement of it since, since he's weighing these different choices and what gets lost depending on what choice he makes, religion or dharma or uh, to, to get to the, love. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, difference in uh, how he's describing his lover. Uh, you possibly, first one would be my lady's wishes, and then the last one would be my, uh, the, and the one in the fourth line would be my love's wishes. Abumo? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I would almost make it a stronger difference than that, whereas the first mm -hmm. one, uh, Tsangma, is, is very respectful, right. whereas the last one is, is one of disregard, mm -hmm. this girl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is, there's, a, a, 
you know, a level of, there's a difference in the tone that would get That's lost. Beautiful. That's true. That's true. Right? That's beautiful. So actually in the first choice, he's, she's in a respected place. And the second one, she's sort of more dispensable because he's going off to retreat. So that's nice. It's really to capture that shift in terminological register. Okay. But I mean, it's not as. I think it's actually the first one is about proximity. Uh huh. I think it's very proximity. If I say proximity with her. Then she is his his lady, uh -huh. and it, almost in order to like imagine retreating from her, losing that proximity, gaining distance from her, she becomes the woman, the girl. Okay, so. nice. Okay, we're getting into some nuance here. Wonderful, and I think yeah, there you get the geography as well. Yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. Lonely mountain retreats are yes, right. Okay, and was there one in the back? Did you have a comment? Oh, I'm just going to uh, disagree a little bit with Paul. Yeah, I think please. Paul can be very uh, intimate and very familiar. <laughs> so now we have the. Imagine that it's just, you know, if you stayed and done my wife, you would be wet. You think there's no difference? Or just for variety's sake. Really? You think. It... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but would it, if you reverse them, would it still say the same? If you put Puma on the first line and Thumb on the fourth, would it still say the same? I think it is better with Nzangma because we are talking about Nzangma, you know, and then uh, Nzangma is also Pumo, so he uses Pumo at the end. If you used otherwise, Pumo on the top, then it wouldn't it wouldn't work. Well, that's my question. Yeah. What is the distinction there? Why is it better to have Zangma in the first line and Pumo on the fourth, and not the other way around? Because uh, he's talking about Zangma. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about the Zangma first, and then. You know, you can't say the same word again, so you say Pumo, but it's the same thing, you know. Okay, we've got another, another uh, opinion on this, so this is wonderful. This is the kind of, you know, fine grain um, distinctions and choices we have to make. In a, in a certain, in cultures that have titles and labels, we tend to start off, or someone would tend to start off with the official title first, and then move from familiar and not from familiar to formal. Mm -hmm. So it goes the other way around, as maybe one reason why Zangmo uh, comes before Pumo, just as a matter of introducing a character rather than introducing her as Pumo and then mm -hmm. using Zangmo in a more formal setting afterwards. So formality comes first and then familiarity, just as how one would talk about another person. OK, but Bumo can also be more generic, mm -hmm. too, so. I mean, just in terms of why Zangmo would come first. I don't think it's a daughter. <laughs> uh, just to follow up real quickly, though, and, and this was a point that comes up. I think maybe this will get discussed in the Kavya. Yes. 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 That's true. It could be misunderstood at up top. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is is because if you look at classical Indian kavya, right, they will do this. Well, they will juxtapose a more honorific term to a less honorific term, for for that dramatic effect. Mm -hmm. So a, a good question, which then comes to some reading something like the Sixth Dalai Lama. It, it begs the question, to what extent is he echoing Kavya tradition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now you get into this whole question of, you know, what do, we, what do we know about his education in formal Indian poetics? Is this hearkening back to that? Well, is this something you need to take into account if you're translating Or you this? could look at the whole collection and see other ways that he uses 
words and to what extent Kavya is playing into the rest of his song. Did you want to add something, Tenzin? Um, and then Greg has... I think uh, if you read the entire work of the, <clears throat> the Dalai Lama's work, he's incredibly, if, you say, if I don't mind, use a smart. <laughs> because uh, in this, what I understood is he wanted to describe his lady. He's saying this is not an ordinary lady, it's a zangma, yeah. one of the best type of the lady. So he's presenting the audience, saying this is not an ordinary lady, because he's known to have many ladies. Yeah. But here he's saying this is one of the you know, best ladies, right? right? And then Pomo is like showing the closeness. Yeah. You know, you don't refer to your lady, my fine lady, but you also Pomo, like you already become close to it. Yeah. So that's how I took it. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So let's have one last comment, Greg, in the back. That's great, the nuance. Sorry for one more interpretation, but uh, yes. actually both lines are quite noble things. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. So, but uh, I think that Pumo is used because it evokes a sense of compassion. Mm -hmm. And the, so there's this uh, feeling of pity or his, heart, his own heart breaking. Uh, so he uses the word Pumo. But Zangma is you should, uh, sort of nobility, it's a call to nobility to be noble and do as a noble lady wishes. Mm -hmm. And so you, you've got this contrast that actually as a practitioner, he would like to do things nobly that a noble lady would wish, but then there's this bad problem. So if he looks at her in this way, it's one set of duty bound or uh, compassion bound. Uh, so I think that's the contrast more as far as I see it. The word puma is somebody you want to protect from, you know, harm. Mm. A good lady you would like to serve her vision. Okay, good. A uh, second, second thing I would say is mm. the assumption that the my, she's my girl, maybe it's just, if you put this in a more abstract sense, it's a fine lady. This is mm -hmm. a principle that one should follow, what a, a, a fine lady says, right. and one should not break a girl's heart. Well, and I think Aris does that, right? He's, he's leaving it generic, right? I think the is even, maybe, I mean, we don't know the, I don't know the context, but I was just questioning whether or not we can actually assume uh, whether it's so a it's my the, or a the. If it's the right. finest of his ladies, then it should be the. By, make, by <laughs> making this contrast. Object. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I know. By making this contrast between principles, these are two principles. Yeah. If you if mm -hmm. you remove it further by saying a girl, it's it's a bit more removed. Although I like the immediacy of imagining him. Oh, sorry, Rinpoche. Yes, yeah. 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 But and the, and the immediacy of imagining that he's sort of is supposed to go on retreat, <laughs> and his lover wants him to stay, and there's something very delightful about that sort of predicament that yeah. would, would sort of be lost if it were abstract. But uh, if the context is put there, and yeah. if I'm talking about you mm -hmm. specifically, uh, you know, and we know I'm talking about you, then if I use the A, mm -hmm. it brings the principle into the specific. Right. So okay. it's just it, yeah. a lot of context has to be there. Okay, great. Boy, if we're, we can debate thes and as, that's, yeah. that's very <laughs> uh, fine grain. Okay, one last. I want to raise a question that I can't puzzle out for myself, but the, the Tunna and Drimna translation seem very distant and acquiesce or whatever you like and wander off. Mm -hmm. But if, if, and I don't know enough about Tibetan poetry to say, but if we use the transitive Drim, like the notion of a binding or entangle, and isn't there a tun, something like tun that means interlace? So, Drim, like, Drim, Drim, like is to buy, you know, has to tighten up, right? Yeah. And, uh, with, with, the, with a transitive drim. Yeah. Transitive, but I'm just saying, I'm asking in poetry whether etymological relationships would be used for allusion, and could we find verbs here which, which kind of played on the similarity between, rather than wander off and acquiesce, we, you know, if I bind myself to the wishes of my lover or if I bind myself to retreat is, is basically where I'm headed, but I don't know how to... Especially when you've got homonyms, yeah. essentially. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, retreat and dream is uh, usually one kind of, um, what can you say? Uh, to, if you go into the mountains and then you retreat there, you always say retreat and dream. Okay, so let's, um, let's move on now. Thank you, everyone. That was a really rich <laughs> conversation. Um, let's see if I can make this go the right way this time. Nope. Okay, so I just, I will very quickly go through um, a translation of my own and then I'm going to turn it over to Roger for the rest of the session to move through um, a comparison of sources from um, uh, different translations of um, Saraha um, and that you have in your handout. But just um, in terms of thinking through um, poetry and the kinds of fidelities, um, I'm always interested in very like specifically Tibetan kinds of um, structures. So this is a classic um, Tibetan parallelism. It's not. It's it's uniquely Tibetan, and so you have um, you have pe pe dun. So analogy, analogy, and then referent. And um, and each of these verses have a really clear structure. So wanting in the translation to create that same cadence of the structure, and particularly the reduplication of um, the, the phonemic repetition. In this case, the, you know, it's the <coughs> verb at the end, and then I put it just at the beginning for greater impact in the English. Um, and then the sort of shift from, so you know, the comparison of never being able to forget um, you know, the golden face of the Jowo and the call of the cuckoo, and then finally, so first being in central Tibet, um, you know, holy site, then very much eastern Tibet landscape, the juniper bushes, and then uh, down to uh, her own beloved um, in the districts of Ling, so this part of eastern Tibet in Golok where they, you know, uh, trace their ancestry and history back to Gesar. And this very subtle shift of just numyung that is added to, you know, um, Jaime. So there's a slight switch there. I can never forget your unwavering mind. And of course, she's addressing then, uh, this is, comes from the letters between Kondra Tarelamo and um, her uh, second husband. These are love letters between them. And so she's saying very early in their correspondence, how he has become unforgettable to her, connecting. Uh, of course, across time, they were Tertans, so they have a history in, in central Tibet together, and then they also trace their past lives to Gesar's time. And so there's all these kind of echoes, both temporal and geographic, but that just cascade down through the um, verses. And so just, you know, for me, it feels so important when we're working, especially in poetry, to think of functional, functional equivalences. And I think it was um, uh, from Anne's group in the back where they said, you know, to have a parallel structure so that we can feel the same kind of rhythm in the translation that we feel um, and can discern and are moved by in the Tibetan. So I just wanted to give that example. And now I'm going to pass. Don't do it. There we go. Pass it to Roger. Okay. And I will be working mostly off the handout here, but this is the, uh, if you will, the, the provocation uh, in relation to which we await your interventions. Um, anyway, uh, this again was, uh, uh, I found this in a, there's a wonderful book by Willis Barnstone. Uh, was it the, is it the Aesthetics of Translation? The, I've, I've forgotten the title now, but uh, he, his epigraphs are, are just a, sort of a, a, a Bartlett's quotations of almost all the great uh, comment, comments on translation that have been made over the years. And because, because they were epigraphs, I, I don't have references. Anyway, um, I, I thought this was an in, intriguing one. Uh, where is, this is from uh, Herder. Where is there a translator who is at the same time a philosopher, a poet, and a philologist? That one is to be the morning star of a new era in our literature. 
One of the things that this evokes immediately uh, for me is our extreme fallibility as translators and the fact that all of us are, uh, however well we may know language A, language B, uh, we all have uh, particular takes on things. We have particular interests, particular inclinations, and those tend to, to shape as well the ways in which we translate. Um, and it, it occurred to me in particular because Saraha is a figure on, on whom I've done a, a bit of work in the past that uh, this, there may or may not be a match in some of the ways in which uh, various people who have had a shot at Saraha, um, including me and Curtis uh, and also Herbert Gunther and also Mohammed Shahidullah for those who read French. Um, and, and what, I've, what I've pulled out on the handout is essentially a, a sequence of eight verses that are not found in any of, as far as, I, actually I, I take it back, one of the verses is found in a Upper Bronx edition, uh, that of, uh, I think it's uh, some Chrétien. Uh, but the others are, are not found at, at all in any of the extant editions in the Abba Bronx. So, so basically people are working off the Tibetan to get a sense of these verses. Um, the, just a couple of things to note, because what I'd like you to do essentially is, is kind of re-aggregate into, into smaller groups. And, and basically I'll, I'll ask uh, each group to just pick one of these eight verses that I've got here. It could be any, any one of them. And to talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, particularly, well, you, you could ask the general question, is, is, there a, is any of these clearly an attempt at a philosophical or a philological or a poetic rendition? That's maybe not so important a question, really. Uh, but, but to return to the kinds of questions we've been kicking around, particularly, uh, well, in relation to the Sixth Dalai Lama's verse especially, in terms of the kinds of choices that the translators have made, um, and to keep in mind these larger questions of how it reads and, uh, you know, that, that, that balance between uh, fidelity and accessibility that, that uh, we all wrestle with so much. Um, so I, I would just, uh, a, a couple of, of quick notes before I let you loose on these things. One is, again, to remember that, that probably there was, we, we don't know this for certain, Saraha, as Curtis has perhaps best shown us, is an extremely elusive figure. Um, we, we, we might presume that there were Apabrangsa or some Indic language originals for these verses, but we don't know that for a fact. But if there were, they would have been uh, in most likely being Dohas, and the Doha being a particular Indic poetic form, they would have been rhyming couplets, essentially. Um, and of course, the Tibetan never carries that over uh, in, into the, the particular translations that are made. So these, these, are, these are verses that are not from a Tibetan figure. Uh, we, we, he's, he's presumed to be an Indic figure of some sort. Um, but because Saraha is so inaccessible to us in so many ways, the whole question of, of the author's voice, in quotes, becomes a, 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 very, a very problematic one. Um, and uh, again, what, what he had in mind has, has been explored for people for a thousand years. And there, there, you can take many positions on uh, whether particular angles on him seem appropriate. And with, with the elusiveness of the original author, uh, I'll put that in singular for the moment, uh, we, we really, uh, we, have, we have far less to go on than we have in the case of, say, a, a Sixth Dalai Lama or, or the, the figures that uh, Holly has worked with. Um, the uh, one other thing is just that, uh, one thing to keep in mind always, I think this has been alluded to perhaps, but, but worth mentioning quickly again, is that uh, translators read each other. <laughs> can be very, very sure of that. And so uh, I know that Curtis did not have access to my translation at the time that he was working on his, but I had, I had uh, helped advise on his dissertation, so I had the advantage of, of seeing what he had done. And I, of course, had read Gunther, and I had read Shahidul, and I'm presuming that Curtis had, re had read both of those as well. So, you know, there is always this, uh, 
I don't know if it's a comparative anxiety or something, <laughs> but uh, and, and there's reaction going on too. I mean, to be honest, I think I originally started working on my own versions of Saraha when I, with greatest respect to a great, great scholar, when I read Gunther's and thought, uh, there's just something that doesn't quite do it for me here, a little bit the way Rinpoche comes. It didn't sort of touch me uh, in ways that I, I, I felt, rightly or wrongly, Saraha might be trying to touch somebody. Um, so there's, there's these, these various, there, there are histories of reading. You know, again, translators are readers, and we read each other's translations, and we take them into account, and we're influenced by them. And, and you know, we, we, we beg, borrow, and steal, too. Um, <laughs> What's the line? Uh, mediocre poets borrow, great poets steal. Uh, I don't know if that could be applied to translators, but uh, anyway. Um, so the other, the other thing is just a small, two small technical notes, as, as was quickly observed by the Mahamudra Wallace uh, in the second row there. There is a, there is a misprint in the, in the Tibetan, uh, in the very, on the, the one on the second page. Obviously, the, uh, in the last line, the la should have a, a a ba head to it, because uh, it's la me. Uh, and the other thing is, and, and I, I just I had to leave this in, even though I noticed it fairly late in the game. Um, in on page three, the, sorry that the pages aren't numbered, but it's the it's the second poem. Um, the in the French, for those of you who who know French, you, you of course know that the French word for breath is souffle. But my computer, without my noticing it, auto corrected it to souffle. And I just thought <laughs> that was a marvelous bit of kind of meta-translation problematic <laughs> that I'm not going to get into at all here. So with that, uh, you know, again, get into groups and pick, pick one, kick it around, and let's see what you come up with. If you could share with someone. It's noted. It's um, let's see. It's forty-two D. It's on the fifth page. But I, I didn't. But I didn't put the apobrancha in. I know it would. Just to see how it's Yeah. It's uh, by num my numbering forty uh, two D. Yeah, my numbers are all 42 ABC. The French here also has a mistake. That's uh, entirely possible. Was it the first French? Well, we had the souffle, but it's another one. Okay. Oh, you don't have it, I think. That's weird. Le Monde. Yeah, you. Uh, yeah. Oh, Le Monde. Yeah, it should be oh, so Le Monde. Le Monde. Le Monde. Le Monde. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, no, no. right. Thank you. C'est vrai. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Right. Um, you did whole world, everybody else did but is it chocolate? That would be good to know. Sometimes it could be wet and close. So, I'm wondering why you're Okay. I should have brought my book, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm 
Give it about five more minutes. Try to wrap it up in the next minute, please. Okay, why don't we uh, why don't we shift back to a more general discussion now? Maybe I'll I'll ask first whether the distinction made in the Herder quote was useful at all. Um, anybody have uh, reflections on that more general point? No, you were digging into the words. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, that's fine. Um, so, okay, maybe I'll just work, we'll work through uh, from first to last. We don't have a, a whole lot of time for each one. Uh, 
one, but um, any, anybody look at the, the first verse, which is uh, the one on what would be page two. I apologize for the lack of pagination. Uh, Semni Namka and so forth. Anybody look at that one? You guys did? Okay, what, any observations? <laughs> Yeah, right. One. Yeah. The first one is right. Semni Namka, right? No, that's a oh, my, my. That's a separate. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, this is all. This is reversed. Okay, this goes from end to beginning. I, that's okay. I, through the feed scan. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, okay. So, so the, the okay. So we'll work from back to front then, since you all did. <laughs> okay. So, so this this would be what what I call uh, 42H, right? So that's the Ubu, uh, etc. Okay. You did look at that one. Okay. <laughs> so that would be the last one, or would it? No. Okay. Yeah. Simni Namka. Is that what we're talking about? Okay, go ahead. I can't see. Anyway, well, tell, tell us which one you're talking about. Maybe that's best. Some of us were looking at contributing. Yeah, different people were looking at, at different ones. So <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> We're going to go through all of them, yeah? That's the idea, if we ever figure out where to begin. The Zubu was the first one. Mm -hmm. I, I gather, yeah. Go ahead. Why don't we start there? Okay. That's where <laughs> Okay, we'll start with Rinpoche okay. on the first one, then we'll come back to you for the second one. Yeah. Yeah. Am I supposed to say something about this? <laughs> well, if there's anything to say. Actually, we were looking at the three translations, and uh, I think we like the second one, no? Yes. We like the second one because um, this mind so tightly bound, relax it, and you are free, no doubt. Although it's yeah, and Yurbu is not too much there, but maybe tightly can represent that. The things that bind the deluded are freedom for the wise. Uh, the grammar doesn't exactly uh, tell you, but uh, I think the meaning seems to be there. Okay. Any thoughts on, uh, did, did any other groups look at this particular one? Brandon et al? Uh, yeah, we looked at this one also. Um, just on the face of it, I think it's interesting how you have what looks like a quatrain, and um, in your translation, Roger, you've broken it into three triplets. Right. Um, and the parsing of stanzas is always an interesting question for me when I'm looking at songs and verse in that usually you don't have any kind of stanzas in Tibetan. Um, right. But the editorial choice to put it in stanzas as all of the, translation, the translations here apart from Shahidullah have done right. seems to make a lot of sense mm -hmm. just in terms of how we read poetry in English. Right. Um, one of the things that's interesting too is the way this first line, the, the na, comes after Lu. So Luna starts the second line, this conditional. So in the first line, it's nice in a way not to move that conditional up, as you know, some of the translations do, Gunther beginning with if, mm -hmm. uh, Schaeffer also beginning with if. Um, again, that's an aesthetic choice. I guess it could bleed into discussions of accuracy as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have comments to make on this too? Yeah, yeah. The uh, just for what it's worth, uh, when when in doing my own translation, I broke it sometimes into triplets, uh, sometimes into 
uh, sets of pairs that, I, I, hoping that I was consistent in this, it had to do with the number of syllables in the Tibetan line, seven or nine. So uh, that, that was, and, and I, I was, as probably would be evident, was trying to play a little bit with the way in which the poetic line in English poetry over the last hundred years or more has been fractured um, and, and was aiming for a, a slightly more contemporary feel, you know, inspired by everybody from Pound to Snyder to, to, to others. Yeah. Okay. I just have a quick question about the third line um, in contrast with the fourth line. Since everyone seems to take it uh, as if it read Nubu, Kangi Mumba Ching, as opposed to how it actually reads. So it, is it possible to think that it actually says in the third line, um, the deluded bind themselves to objects, right? Because the agentive on Mbe, but um, the wise are liberated by them. I mean, I'm just curious because everyone seemed to take Ngoba as the instrumental there. But it's not. No, that's an. Shouldn't it be though? Well, well, that's a good question, right? Is the corrupt text? Oh, mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the question. But as this text re reads right here, it doesn't say that. So there are a lot of philologists in the room, Roger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the, <laughs> that's the moral of that story. Yes, <laughs> really, exactly. <laughs> More God than we that. want. <laughs> okay, so uh, so what's what's next in the? I'm order? sorry. Can I just make one response to oh, Brandon, sorry. which is the stanzas and. I, I can't remember if I did on this one, but I tried to pull my uh, creation of stanzas from commentarial literature. That's where, because there was, didn't seem to, it wasn't, it's not quatrains in this, right? Because the, the, right. the Tibetan translation of the Doha of the pairs does not separate uh, um, in, into any regular pattern. And it's three, four, five. Um, and so it was just from looking at how different commentaries broke it, broke it up. I don't know if that's a good practice or not. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so on to the next one. Yeah, uh, which is what? <laughs> well, okay. Sem that's then it's semnin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just the last one got put first. Yeah. So sem semnin namka. Anybody work on that one? Oh yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. So we were wondering about the third line, yi te yi ma, yin par girna. We were wondering um, how thought became the translation for yi. Gender. We were wondering how the translation uh, for yi became thought, mm -hmm. and we were curious if that was coming from the Sanskrit as opposed to yeah. using something like mind. Of course, you've got. I mean, if you if you look at the look at all four translations, including. The French, you've got uh, esprit, right? In in French, yeah. Um, and I, I would leave it to someone who knows French better than I do to comment on the appropriateness of that. That that might be a whole other interesting discussion, but we should focus on English, I expect. Um, so we've got ecologically, not to be confused with ecologically predisposed awareness, right? E um, and Curtis uh, picked up a somewhat similar theme uh, with egoic thought, right? Um, I mean, I think my own choice of thought there probably, for better or for worse, came out of a sense of the way this is sometimes used in, say, Abhidharma contexts or in, in epistemological contexts. Uh, obviously, when you get into terminology of lo and yi and sem and all this, uh, trying, to, trying to parse out how somebody like a Mahasiddha is using these terms. And, and you know, we should, obviously, we should not presume 
In fact, perhaps to the contrary, that Mahasiddhas didn't know their Abhidharma. Uh, and, and I often wonder why particular terms came up in the ways that they did. I, I was simply uh, reflecting my own, you know, probably other ways that I had, similar to ways I had translated that in non-tantric contexts in the past. And that, as that might or might not be a good practice either. From a, con from a contemplative point of view, I don't think it makes much difference whether you translated its mind or thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah I think what he's striving at is fairly clear. Uh, yeah. Um, other, other comments on, on that one? Uh, yes. Uh, my comments, are, I think, second line. Nam ki ranshi ni tu sem soncha. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the I think Namki Ranshi is important here. The nature of sky, the nature of sky. I think that should be there. I think uh, I kind of see all translations miss that part. Other than that, uh, all these translations, I think Curtis translation flows well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So for instance, my naturally spacious probably drifts a little far from. From what uh, what the Tibetan says, yeah, I can I can see that. This is the great thing about publishing a book. There it is, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, what about dust? You say don't grasp all the time, and then you say here grasps the mind. Maybe. Maybe grasp is a too strong word for Zuma here? I, I was taking grasp, uh, in, in my case anyway, and you know, it's got that wonderful, in Tibetan generally, that wonderful double sense of epistemologically grasping, and, and, and of course it simply has a, a, a negative and sense to it too. Curtis, yeah. I just wanted to point out in the second line of my translation, just like the sky, so should the mind be held. It's blank verse, but I had no intention of making blank verse there <laughs> because this was 20 years ago and I wasn't thinking at all about translating into uh, any sort of meter. So I don't know, what does that say? It's about the power of form, I guess, yeah. huh? Right? That it's even as someone who, I, not raised a Christian, not raised reading King James Bible, just it's a, I inhabited that form. Uh, Must have read yeah. Shakespeare right? somewhere <laughs> along the line. No. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, all right. What about then the next one? Uh, Kedar Jena, right? Anybody look at that one? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, moving right along. Uh, Lundang Medang. Wang Chengapana. Anybody do that one? No? Okay. Okay, next. Kim Dang Kimna. Anybody look at that? Great minds truly think alike. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. So Chak Tamshe Kunayang. Is this the 42D? The, uh, the well, I was asking about 42D. Yeah. I just had, yes, that's I the just one. Had that, a, I just noticed that the difference in the way you translate it is corrupted by thought versus Curtis's all things are belittled by thought. And I was just curious about that distinction um, uh, compared to Gunther's demean with represent, representational mode of thinking. Um, sorry, I don't know one, the Tibetan, so I, 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 which I was just want? curious about Okay. Um, the difference in the Tibetan. Um, so I'm sorry, Dave. Which which one are you asking about? Forty two D. Right. House but, after house. Right. And which which aspect of it? Uh, where you say in your third line, Zoraha says the whole world is corrupted by thought. Right. Curtis um, says all things are belittled by thought. 
Oh yeah, this right, and this came up. Uh, yeah, Steve Steve raised this question. This uh, I, I sort of slightly revised the last two lines because because they're the, the first two lines, the the Tibetan and the Upper Bronxia match pretty well, I think. Uh, the last two, the Tibetan, is significantly different. But I, what happened here actually, because this is something I just did the other day, is that what I have, uh, the whole world, does ref it, it doesn't really re reflect the Tibetan so much. I, Drokun, I would tend to tend to say all beings, uh, and and I just uh, it was a, a mental slip because it, it is in, in the Upper Bronx, as as Steve suggested, it, it is Jagat, which. In, in the Upper Bronx, or for that matter, the Sanskrit or the or the Hindi context, tends to mean world. Although obviously it's got some ambiguities. Uh, you know, I, I used to, I had this uh, little button, you know, like you wear a little button on my office door for many uh, years that that use use the word in an ambiguous way too. So it it, it has some ambiguities, um, but but that's that's what was going on with that particular point. Okay, so uh, then going back to Sochak Tamshi, anybody do that one? Okay, uh, Kassandering? Yeah, we did that one. You did that one, okay. We've got to take her. So, um, we thought that for the second line, uh, maybe desire would be more appropriate than uh, claim. Um, going along with the uh, mm. this kind of uh, notion of impermanence that people would uh, wish or desire for things to be perfect mm. but wouldn't notice their decline and so it would be a teaching on impermanence. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a plausible reading as well. I, yeah. Can certainly see that. Oh, and we wanted an instrumental or an agent particle after a uh, cable, of course, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering whether, given the fact that there's no, uh, you know, agent of particle after kewo there and kewo do, that you know, could another reading of this being mm -hmm. that uh, they take people as being perfect objects, then you would have much more impact of the water going through your hands because what you're losing is people, not just sense objects. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Uh, I think it's a teaching moment for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess, you know, I guess the, the, the comment I would make, which is, is not worth a whole lot, and I would, I would defer much more to uh, Tibetan speakers in the audience, but I've, I've never run into an expression even close to that, but, but maybe others have. Um, and that's not to say that Saraha would not have come up with a, an utterly unique expression. Did, did, Ripshe, did, did you understand, do you want to repeat your sure. comment, uh, perhaps for, for Rinpoche's reaction? In Rinpoche, this is in Kasang. The, the, the verse says kasang, and in the third line, in the second line, where at the end it says, you know, do, there I was wondering whether you could translate that line as being, they take people as being perfect objects. In other words, the, there's, there's no subject designated there, so the object is, you know, they assert or they take kyawo, people, as being donam punsum sopa, like that whether that makes any sense. I thought it was like uh, the shiu and the shiu is like people. People think or people, uh, what can you say? People like to shiu uh, and do. What they do is turn the person sofa. Yeah? I was thinking maybe it would be kill wolves. No, because uh, one comment and then still numb. The last slide. It's not. Uh, uh, this is uh, grammatically. I think this is correct. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, so um, I just want to note that we are at 
4.15, and people might want to take advantage of the break for uh, tea and whatever snacks are offered. Um, so feel free to talk to either of us about the remaining pages if you'd like. But one comment I wanted to make before people get up, hang on. Um, and Roger has one little tantalizing slide to show to end, is that when we looked at these translations, apart from a question about the verse, we all went right to accuracy. And that's just yeah. interesting to notice about us. So, um, you know, we might, you know, in future conversations, think about style as well. And then, Roger, you have one last. Yeah, this is just a... Uh... We thought if you wanted to establish a really severe polarity on views of how translation ought to be done, Nabokov's, uh, the clumsiest literal translation is a thousand times more useful than the prettiest paraphrase. And we can talk about the meaning of paraphrase there, perhaps. But uh, that's on the one hand. And then Douglas Hofstadter in Escher Bach, uh, go to Lesher Bach, it seemed to me imperative, talking about the Chinese translation, to reconstruct the book in, an, in the new cultural context, that is to respect the spirit by disrespecting the letter. This, this seemed to both of us to, to kind of <laughs> capture, again, the, the, the poles between which it seems to me we all are working all the time. So anyway, so thank, thank you all, you all for, all coming for coming and for your yeah. contributions. And <laughs>